Amen. So John chapter 21. So we're in the last chapter of the Gospel of John and the second to last sermon. So we're going to look at the first part of John chapter number 21 this evening um, where Peter and the disciples are out fishing. Look it down at verse number 1 of John chapter 21. We're only going to get a few verses in here. We're going to go um, to about um, three verses in and just take a look at what happened here. Look at verse number 1. So Jesus has resurrected from the dead, and he's shown himself twice so far to the disciples. Peter has seen Jesus um, at this point, and he is out fishing with um, the, some of the other disciples. Look at verse number 1 of John no, chapter number 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise he showed himself. So this is the third time. The Sea of Tiberias is just another name for the Sea of Galilee, which is the the large body of water, it's, kind of, it's a lake, really. It's a, it's a large lake that is, I don't know, 100 or so miles north uh, northeast of Jerusalem. Look at uh, verse number 2. It says, There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two other of his disciples. So if you count that up, there's seven of them here. So seven of the 12 disciples are here. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. So you say, what's the problem here? So Simon takes seven of the twelve disciples fishing after Jesus has um, risen from the dead. You say, what's the problem? Turn to Matthew chapter number four to get some context on um, where Peter um, has come from. Remember, um, many of the disciples were fishermen, and Peter and his brother and also James and John were fishermen. Look at Matthew chapter number 4, and this is where we see Jesus calling the first two disciples, Andrew and Peter. Look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 18. You say, what's the problem with Peter going fishing here in uh, verse number 3 of John 21. Matthew 4, 18, let's get some context here. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, so again, this is where he found them, all right? This is where he found the disciples, the first disciples that he called when he started his ministry. It says, Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed him. Turn to Luke um, chapter, I'll just read for you Luke chapter number 5 and verse number 11. Where we get another um, account of that same story. It says, And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. All right? So look, these were commercial fishermen. These guys were fishermen for a living. When Peter said, I go a-fishing, he wasn't talking about getting a pole and a tackle box and sitting on the shore. They were going out in ships, and they were casting nets, and they were making a living fishing. And Jesus said, stop doing that, follow me. And in Matthew um, chapter 4, and then again in Luke chapter 5, we see that they left everything to follow Jesus. And here, kind of this odd thing, you say, what's the problem? Is there's this odd event where after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, where Peter has seen the resurrected Jesus... He drops that, and he goes back to fishing. And not only does he go back to fishing, he brings six of the disciples with him. All right, so in Luke chapter 5, verse number 11, it says they forsook all. I mean, they told their families, they told their dad that they fished with, they, you know, they told Zebedee that, hey, we're out of the business. I mean, can you imagine your two sons coming to you and just being like, we're out now, and we're following um, this guy. I mean, so just a pre-sermon thought for you. This isn't what the sermon is about, while it easily could be about this, but they forsook all. The question for you is, do you have to? Have you forsaken all um, in your life? Did you have to forsake all to come to church tonight? Did you have to, like, leave everything behind just to come to church tonight? You know, no, you didn't, is the answer. And the problem is, is today, is the overall problem compared to the disciples that forsook all in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter number 5, is today people can't forsake anything. That's a problem today. 
All right. So look, tonight though, I don't want to talk about forsaking thing tonight. I want to talk about what Peter did. I want to talk about what Peter did and how he took over half the disciples with him when he went and he just went back to his life of fishing. So tonight I want to talk about discouragement and just to just to have a positive spin on the, the sermon, I want to talk about discouragement versus encouragement. All right. I want to talk about discouragement versus encouragement. So first of all, the first point I have is a very quick one because it's very similar to what I preached on last um, Wednesday where I talked about faithfulness versus fearfulness. So the first thing that you need to understand is that discouragement, being discouraged, it happens to everyone. So before, you know, we're so hard on Peter, there's a lot of unflattering stories in the Bible about Peter. All right, but Peter, he does get things together and he does end up doing great things, of course, with his life. But the point is, Peter got discouraged, but it's normal to get discouraged. People get discouraged. Every Christian, especially in their Christian life and their spiritual life, will go through discouragement. It happens to everyone. So if you say, I'm discouraged and what's wrong with me? The answer is, nothing is wrong with you. People get discouraged. It's very simple. All right? People go through cycles of encouragement and discouragement. Life is, life is peaks and valleys. I mean, life isn't just all great all the time. I mean, that's, that's fake. That's not real. Okay? But what matters is what direction you take when you are discouraged. And that's what I really studied and focused on in you know, the Doubting Thomas sermon on faithfulness versus fearfulness. So somebody that's faithful, it's not that somebody that's faithful never gets discouraged, it's that they remain faithful through their discouragement. They, it's, it's not that they never get afraid, it's just that that doesn't define what they do. Somebody that's fearful, that fear defines what they do. It's the same thing with discouragement. If, so, if discouragement comes to you and you let that discouragement define what you do, that's a problem. And that's what happened to Peter. Peter got discouraged and he changed action, he changed course. And not only that, but the second point I want to, you to see tonight is that Peter discouraged others. When he could have been an encouragement to others, Peter was a discouragement to others. Now look, people in general underestimate their ability here. People underestimate their ability to encourage or their ability to discourage. Because every single person in this church, every single person in a family, every single person out in the world has the ability to encourage people or discourage people just by what they do. It's a powerful thing that all people have. And look, Peter, he just led people out of the Christian life here. And it's not a good thing. Instead of preaching the resurrected Christ, you say, well, what's the big deal? They went fishing. Well, what's the, I mean, the big deal is, what were they supposed to be doing? What's the very next chapter in the Bible? They were supposed to be doing and starting the Acts of the Apostles. That's the, that we studied through that entire book, and we know what they reset themselves and got back to, and we know what they accomplished. That's what they were supposed to be doing. When the angel in Acts chapter 2 says, why, ye, why do you stand there just gazing? I mean, that's the urgency of the situation. They were not supposed to go back to their homes and their, their old businesses and all those things. They were supposed to get moving in the Christian life. They were, start, they were, they were to go out and preach the resurrected Christ. They were to go out and do what we do. And they were supposed to get started doing that now. So, I mean, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this, uh, turn, to, turn to 2 Timothy uh, chapter number 4. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. I was thinking about this as I was, I was walking through the park and I was looking at, I don't know why this thought came into my head, I think I was thinking about this sermon, but I was walking through the park looking for those stations that we're going to go to on Tuesday, and I was just thinking, like, what's the point of this church? I was thinking, like, what's the point of this church? Yeah, I get it that, you know, Hebrews 10, 25, I've preached that to you, like, I don't know, a thousand times, you know, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together like the manner of some is. Like, you're supposed to come to church. But I was just thinking, like, just from a practical standpoint, like, what's the point of this church? Like, what would happen? Like, what would happen if, like, we just didn't have a church? 
what would happen? Well, look at 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 2. I mean, I get it. It's a command in the New Testament. The New Testament talks about individual churches. But all that aside, like what would happen if there wasn't churches? What would be the result? If you just think about that for a second. Well, the first problem would be this. I mean, the first point of a church is to solidify and preach doctrine. That's, that's the reason for the church. That's why one of the reasons God set up the local New Testament church. Look at 2 Timothy 4, verse number 2, where he's telling the pastor here, he's telling a pastor, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He's saying, you know, look, the pastor's going to have to go and you're going to have to preach things. This is one of the main reasons for a church, is so people can hear doctrines. Because you say, well, why can't people just hear doctrines themselves? Because the people won't want to hear the doctrines. That's why. If you read this verse, there's a lot of negative things in here. I mean, reprove, rebuke, you know, with all, I mean, instant in season and out of season. The problem is, is that people won't just want to, you know, read things and apply things in their lives that are out of season. That's why God sets up a church with a qualified man of God to preach the word, whether it's popular or whether it's not. Right? which a lot of it is not today. All right? But people wouldn't do that without a church. They wouldn't hear that. I mean, that's the point of the preaching is for a pastor to get up and teach doctrines uh, of the Bible to the people. And to remind, look, it's really to, it's really, it's really to remind you of doctrines that you should already know because you're reading the Bible yourself and you're learning things yourself. I mean, hopefully the only time you open a Bible isn't like when the Bible's being preached to you. You should be reading the Bible, you should be learning the Bible, learning those doctrines. But really, a, a good pastor should teach you those doctrines, you should know those doctrines, but then he should show you how to apply those doctrines to your life. And that's an important part of church. And he should show you. He should teach you how to apply it, and he should show you how to apply that doctrine. A good pastor, the Bible says, should be an example to the flock. A good pastor should be an example of those doctrines, of those teachings. You know, it, it wouldn't work if I just like stood up here and was just some hypocrite and just taught you all these things from the Bible and then like my life was a train wreck. I mean, that wouldn't work because nobody would follow that. So the pastor is to preach the doctrine. He is to teach the doctrine, he is to show you how to apply the doctrine, and then he is to be an example of that applied doctrine. All right, well, no pastor is perfect. I'm certainly not perfect, but this is the idea, one of the reasons of the church. Now turn to Acts chapter 14. So I'm, I'm just walking and I'm thinking about, what if there was no church? If there was no church, doctrine would fall apart. Like, it, it would just, there would be no doctrine if there was no local church. If there was no local church, with a pastor preaching from the Bible, there would just be, I mean, just look, look, even if there is, I mean, look at how many churches are preaching false doctrine when there is a local New Testament church. Imagine if there was no, you know, real local New Testament church with an actual candlestick in it, what chance would the actual truth have? And the answer is none. Turn to Acts chapter 14 and verse number 21. Here's another reason for the church, all right? I was just thinking about what if there was no church? Well, if there was no church, there would be no fellowship. You say, well, what's the point of that? I mean, here's the point, is so we can feel like we're not alone. So you can be a Christian that believes these doctrines and applies these doctrines, and you can not be alone in your Christian life. Because look, you're going to be peculiar if you're doing this right. You're going to be separated if you're doing this right. You're going to be peculiar if you're doing this right. People are going to you know, put you through tribula tribulation. People are going to put you through persecution if you're doing this right. And look, that's tough to do alone. That's tough to do by yourself. And God knows that. Jesus Christ knows that. Look at Acts chapter 14, verse number 21. Look what they did here in Acts chapter 14, verse 21. It says, and when they had preached the gospel to that city. So they just went out and they just had a whole day of, of, or days of soul winning, and I was just preaching the gospel, and taught many, they returned again to Lystra, and to Iconium, and Antioch, confirming, these are the churches, these are separate churches, confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith. You see that? 
It doesn't say confirming the souls of the disciples like getting them saved again. It's just saying like shoring them up in their spiritual life. They're going out and they're just preaching the gospel to all these different places and then they're meeting back at their local churches to do what? To just exhort themselves to continue, it says. They're exhorting themselves. You know what that means? They're encouraging themselves. Because maybe there were some people that knocked some doors that they just got the door slammed in their face all day long. Well, they came back and they saw that the other group had a lot of success. And you know what? That encourages you. That builds you up. That confirms your soul. And that we must, look at this, exhorting them to continue in the faith. Maybe some people got beat up out there. Maybe some people got arrested. Maybe people got smacked around in this time. Look, this wasn't, you know, 2024 America here. We're talking about the Roman Empire. All right? There was violence there. I mean, pretty much violence. It was, I mean, I don't want to say it was the Wild West, but I mean, it was, it was a violent time. All right? Look, it says through much tribulation. It says exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we much, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So what are they doing? They're exhorting the people that had a difficult time, that had maybe got hurt, and maybe somebody even got killed out there. But they're exhorting them, and they're saying, look, Jesus told us this. Jesus told us that we're going to have tribulation. Jesus told us that we're going to be persecuted if we actually do what he told us to do. And they're just exhorting and building each other up. They're encouraging one another. Where? In their local churches. They went back to their local churches and refit artillery before they went back out. Look at verse 23. And they ordained them elders in every church. And they prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they passed through Pisidia, they came to Pam Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Atalia. So now they're out soul winning again. And then sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God, for the work which they fulfilled. So they go out and they hit these other cities again. And when they were come, and what did they do? And gathered the church together. They rehearsed all that God had done with them. And how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode a long time with the disciples. So what did they do? They went back to Antioch. They went and they hit all these other cities. And they rehearsed. You know what, that, you know what that's explaining that they did? This is what you all do after you go out soul winning on Sunday when you come back. And you're all sitting together. And I, I'm watching everybody out in the fellowship hall before church on Sunday evening. What are you doing? You're rehearsing what happened. You're talking about how it went out there. Went good for them and not good for them. And these people got six people saved. And remember that day we got 18 people saved? Amen. I mean, that was quite a rehearsal. But you're sitting out there and what are they doing? You're just encouraging people. And not, it doesn't even matter. I mean, look, I personally, when I go out and I don't have anyone talk to me at all, I look forward to coming back to that rehearsal. Because I look for, because I know, like, hey, if I'm taking one for the team here, I know somebody's getting somebody saved right now. And it always works that way. You come back, and during the rehearsal, you hear that, like, another group had a lot of success. Just got into a hot spot of people and, and got a bunch of people saved. And it's just great. But look, what are they doing? They're encouraging one another. So this is another huge reason for the church, for the exhortation, for the encouragement of the saints. So we can encourage one another. In Hebrews 3, actually turn there. Go to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 3, in verse number 13. Hebrews chapter 3, in verse number 13, the Bible says this. It says, But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You see, as I'm thinking about what is the point of the church, the point of the church is doctrine to solidify and to keep people in doctrine, but it's really also to encourage people among the brethren. It is to encourage people to continue in the faith. And look, if there was no church where people were encouraged to go soul winning and people were encouraged to stay in the Christian life, stay spiritual, stay connected with God, they wouldn't do it. Right. And what would happen? They would fall into sin. They would fall into sin. This is why many times people that fall out of church had first fallen into sin. So we're a small church. We're a small, growing church. But what I want to point out tonight is that because we are not a huge church with hundreds of people in it, each individual person has a higher percentage of responsibility to encourage 
or to discourage. It's very important for a church, especially one that is not a huge church. Everybody has the ability to encourage and everybody has the ability to discourage. So look, how do you, how do you encourage? How do you encourage? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that in just the context of our church. All right? How do you, or, or just, just a church, how do you encourage people in church? You're like, do you want to be an encouragement or do you want to be a discouragement? I mean, hopefully no one's like, I want to discourage people. But people misunderstand and people don't realize how easy it is to discourage people. And also how easy it is to encourage people. And that's what I want to show you tonight. Because look, it's not hard to encourage people, folks. It's not hard to be on the encouraging side of things. Just think about, I mean, the first, the first way, the first main way to encourage people in a church, especially it's super, I mean, it's important in every church, but it's especially important in a smaller church is to participate. That is the, that is the main reason. Just think about it. participate in what? Participate in everything. It's important. I mean, you just think about soul winning, and I'm really glad that we have, like, this is not a problem here. We have a high participation in soul winning here. And guess what? That's encouraging. Because soul winning can be a very discouraging experience at times. But as long as there's a lot of people in your church that go soul winning, it's like, it's an encouraging thing no matter what. I mean, you go out and you have what would normally be like just if it was just you soul winning and you were the only one that lived in Fresno that went soul winning and you went out and nobody wanted to talk to you and everybody was just like, get out of here. And you did that for two weeks. And it was just super unreceptive for two weeks. I mean, do you go two weeks sometimes without getting somebody saved? Sure. I mean, in Fresno, if you go soul winning a lot, that's, that's kind of a long time to go without getting somebody saved. But it's possible to go two weeks without getting somebody saved. Look, by yourself, that's very discouraging. But with a church, it's, you go out and you just get a really rude neighborhood and it's kind of funny. Yeah. I mean, it's, not, it's, just like, it's just like water. It's like water off a duck's back. When you have a lot of people doing what? Participating. Participating. So soul winning is a big one and I'm very, very thankful, especially since it's the first work. I am, very, I am super, I, I hate saying this word, but I'm super proud of our church. You know what I mean by that. I'm super proud of our, our soul winning participation. It is my goal. It is my goal that, that everyone in this church would become a soul winner and would go, go soul winning at, at least once a week. That's my personal goal. You know, I, you know, I, most weeks I go twice a week and guess what? My wife, she would never want me to say this, but my wife, she goes, and I've actually tried to back her off a little bit, but she goes soul winning most times with my daughter, three times a week. She goes more than I do. And you know why she does that? First of all, she likes going soul winning. Because I've, I've talked to her about this. And I'm just like, I don't want you burning yourself out. You're working too hard at this. And she's like, well, I like going soul winning. I like to go. And I just don't want, so I'm kind of watching to make sure she's not working too hard and getting stressed out or anything. But she does it mainly because she likes it, number one. And number two, she wants to be an encouragement to the ladies of the church, and that's why she does it. I'm sorry to bring this up. I know that you don't like that, but I, I want to point that out. It is important that, you know, we encourage one another. And, you know, so sh she goes so she can be an encouragement to others. All right, look, there, there's all kinds of other things that I could bring up. How about this one? Like, I don't know why, but like sign-up sheets is another one. Sign-up sheets. Let me tell you how I used to operate when I went to Verity Baptist Church with sign-up sheets. Whenever, I don't know why it's so hard to get Baptists to sign up for sign-up sheets. It's, it's, it's impossible. But whenever there was any kind of event at Verity Baptist Church, I made sure that we signed up right away. I, I mean, that's how I operated. I didn't even know what it was many times or when it was. I would just tell my wife, sign us up right away. Why? Because I want people to see that there's people signing up for the church activities. I want people to look at the sign-up sheet and see, oh, there's a lot of people going to this thing. Because why? Because it encourages people. And you know what? It encourages the pastor's wife who's organizing many of those activities. So, I mean, that's just another thing. Just like, but people don't sign up. I don't know why people don't sign up for sign-up sheets. 
I, I have all kinds of theories. I don't even know if I should mention them. But I mean, it, it takes a commitment to put your name on a sign-up sheet. I think that's the main thing. You have to kind of say, like, you know what? I'm just going to do that thing. But you know what? It's an, I want you to know, like, it's an encouragement to people. It's not a nothing burger. When it's out there, you know, participation marks encouragement to a church. And that shows that people are going to participate. All right? Here's another one. I'm going to embarrass some people here. Here's another one. Singing. You know, singing encourages people. Singing encourages people. And I think our song, new song leader is doing a great job, by the way. But singing encourages or discourages people. So, you know, if people don't sing, it can be discouraging, especially to visitors. Especially to visitors that come in and they came from a church with purple lights and smoke machines and rock bands, and they come in here and we sing the old hymns, but we don't sing them though. We sit here, we sit here and we're like, you know how I know you're not singing? Because your lips aren't even moving. So here, here's, a, here's a positive and a negative spin on this. You sit here and you have your your hymnal open, and you're, I mean, here's the thing. The hymnal is already open. Why not sing? That's the positive spin on it. The negative spin on it would be, just close your hymnal if you're not going to sing. No, don't close your hymnal. You're already halfway there. You, you took the time to open the hymnal. You turned. You turned to the actual song. And you're not singing. But here's the thing. You say, well, my voice isn't good. Do you think my voice is good? No one here thinks my voice is good. But here's the thing. If you've ever been to a big church, if you've ever been to a big church, and you've heard that, that great singing at a conference, and you're just like, man, this is awesome. Guess what? None of those people, the vast majority of those people, do not have good voices. Most people don't have good voices. But when they all sing together, it sounds good. It's like a miracle. But we have to sing. So look, we have more of a responsibility because we're a small church. So everyone carries more of a weight. So look, we should, we should sing. We should participate in the singing. And guess what? When people hear a small group of people singing in a building that's not huge, you know what? That will encourage people. So the more you sing, the more that encourages the person next to you to sing. And the more that encourages other people in the church to sing, it's an encouragement. Be an encouragement. Amen. I mean, it's uh, men's preaching night. Sign up. Preach. Amen. Participate. All these things are super important for encouragement. I mean, just activities in general. Activities in general. I mean, people are just like, well, you know, the more people that don't go to activities, the more people that will not want to go to activities. And that's what we kind of need to understand. It's, it's more, the more people that are faithful to those things, and guess what? The more people that are faithful to activities, the more activities there will be. That's another thing that we need to realize. Because we're just not going to have a bunch of activities that people don't come to. Because guess what? That's discouraging. That's discouraging. So participation is huge for a church of our size. Everyone kind of bears, you know, more responsibility on top of that, all right? So look, Peter also, Peter also, he was a leader. He was a leader. And this is another thing that you need to recognize. The more of a leader that you are, the more ability you have to encourage or to discourage people. So that means that the higher up the food chain you are in whatever organization, your family, whatever, the more of an encouragement or discouragement you can be. Peter was a leader. That's why he was able to take like two-thirds of the disciples with him. He took, you know, over half of the entire, you know, force to just quit and just go fishing with him. So, I mean, you know, I've heard this statement. I've heard this statement before that complaints, complaints should only go up. Have you ever heard about, that? ever heard this statement? That you should never, like, what it's saying is you should never complain down to people. Like, say I'm a boss and I should never just go to the people that work for me and just complain you know, about, you know, the, the company or whatever. And, you know, they say complaints should only go up. But, I mean, I kind of understand that statement because it would be a huge discouragement to the people below you. But 
complaints, I mean, they really shouldn't go up either. Because you think about it, if you go to work and just do nothing but complain to your boss, and where's that going to get you? You know, it's not going to get you anywhere, right? So complaints are just discouragements, right? I mean, your boss would just think you're a complainer. You're just going to discourage people below you. And that's what Peter did is he discouraged all the people beneath him, all right? There's really no place for complaints. So le as leaders, turn to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5 as, you know, husbands, moms, everyone's a leader in one way or another. Church members, church members that have been here for longer than other church members. Look, a church member that's been here for several years is going to have much more ability to encourage people or discourage people than somebody that just came here three months ago and isn't really free to thrive and doesn't really come that much. You know, those type, you know, the, the person that's been here, that's a mature Christian, they have a much stronger ability to encourage or discourage people than people that are newer to the Christian life and they're just kind of getting rolling on this thing. But look, those are the people, the newer people are the ones that will be easily discouraged by the older people. Look at 1 Peter 5 and verse number 5. When I say older people, I mean spiritually older. Look at verse number 5. It says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. And it's talking about, you know, younger people submitting to the elder, but really we can apply this to spiritual maturity as well. So you have a bunch of people that look up to you as a Christian, that look up to you as a more mature Christian. You have, the, you have a lot of power. Look, I'm not the only one that can encourage people in this church, folks. I'm not the only one that can discourage people in this church. So keep that in mind that you all have an incredible ability to encourage or discourage people. And spiritually immature people, newer people, visitors, they don't come much. They have much less influence, but they're much easier to encourage and also discourage. I mean, it's a, there's a responsibility to becoming a mature Christian. There is a responsibility that lays upon our shoulders. People look up to you. Pe people look up to you. And, you know, they look at somebody that, that they look at as a mature Christian or a more mature Christian, and they look at somebody that would get backslidden or fall away, and they say, if they can't make it, what chance do I have? If this person that's been doing this and been saved for years, if, if they can't do this, what chance do I have when I just started? But also, you know, you can be that encouragement. So look, the influence is more, both good and bad. Turn to John chapter 21, go back to verse number 4. John chapter 21, look at verse number 4. So now Jesus sees them, and look at verse number 4. It says, but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, No. It's interesting that he called them children there. He doesn't usually call them children. I wonder why that was. Just, you know, like, he, he's just think how many times he's had to correct Peter and correct James and John and all these. And now he's literally risen from the dead, and here they are, and he's just like, What in the world? And what did he tell them about the children? He's like, unless ye believe like little children. And he's just like, children, what are you doing? What is going on? The book of Acts is right, is, is right around the corner here. And you guys are out fishing without any clothes on. <laughs> I don't believe he was completely naked, by the way. That's just a, another point. But the point is, I want you to understand the importance of encouragement tonight. All right, and the importance of staying away from discouragement. I mean, you th have to think about this, folks. You know, when it comes to this church, not everyone has. You've got to think about it. You've got to kind of get outside yourself. Not everyone has what you have. Not everyone, you know, some people have children. Some people don't. Some people are married. Some people are not. Some people have forsaken a lot to come to the church like this. Some people have forsaken much more than others to come to church. And look, they want to grow and to thrive. So we need to make sure that we are on the encouragement side of things and not the discouraging side of things. To encouraging people, 
Let's look at some contrast. To encouraging people, you say, I want to be an encouragement. To encouraging people, church is a priority. Amen. To discouraging people, it's an option. And you will see that with people that are discouraging and encouraging. And in order for a church to grow, in order for a church to grow, the encouraging people must win over the discouraging people. This is my battle. This is my battle. I'm trying to encourage people. I'm trying to encourage people, grow this church, encourage you, encourage you to stay in church, keep soul winning, keep doing the things that you're supposed to do, encourage you to make friendships, encourage you to you know, get things right in your life, encourage you to do the things that I preach in the Bible. I'm trying to be an encouragement. And look, I, I, I have to outweigh the discouragements. That's my job. Well, and then people will say this. People will say this. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Turn to Acts chapter 2. People will say this. Well, well uh, God grows the church. God grows the church. Well, okay. I mean, agree. God grows the church. And they get that from Acts chapter 2. But let's look at Acts chapter 2. And look at verse number, look at verse number 44. Actually, 45. The end of Acts chapter 2. But in order for the church to grow, because this is, the, this is the famous verse that people use to say God grows the church, the last verse where it says, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily as should be saved. So they're getting people saved, those people are getting into church, and God is growing the church, the Bible says. Great! That's exactly what should happen. But look at the verses before. It says, and they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their manna with gladness and singleness of heart. This was an encouraging group of people right here. So yeah, God added to this church daily, but this was 100%. What we're talking about here, when I say church is a priority for the encouragement people, the people on the encouraging side of the coin, is that these are the people that are sold out. A church, for it to grow, needs more people that are sold out than are not. And the sold out must win over the people where it's just like, yeah, I think maybe I'll go today, maybe I won't. I think maybe I'll be a soul winner this week, and maybe next week I won't. Those people, they're encouragement one day, they're a discouragement the next. And those people, they cannot win. Because in Acts chapter 2, where God was adding to the church daily, it was nothing but encouraging people. They literally forsook everything. I mean, they were all in one accord, and they were just going after it. There was nothing. I mean, it's a prerequisite to God growing the church. So my point, whereas this is what I'm up against, is I'm trying to get that prerequisite so God can grow this church. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. That's what needs to happen. The encouragements need to outweigh the discouragements. And then you have people, we had people years ago that are no longer here. We had people years ago where they would go around and, look, don't be this person. They'd go around like, huh, you know, why isn't this church growing? As they go around, like, you know, discouraging people. They're going around, like, asking the question, like, well, you know, shouldn't the, the church be growing? And, you know, I don't know, the, the, church isn't, the church isn't growing. And they're going around behind everyone, the church isn't growing. And why isn't the church growing? growing you know, according to them yeah. in their own mind and why isn't the church growing and, and one of them gave me a book on like how to grow a church and we're just like you know hey keep the book stop discouraging people Amen. stop being a discouragement stop going around and just you know trying to tell people something's wrong with the church why don't you just be an example why don't you just be a mature christian why don't you be faithful to the church why don't you go soul winning why don't you come out and just be an encouragement to your brothers and sisters in christ and we'll get this prerequisite out of, the, out of the way, and God will grow the church daily. That's how it works. Look, if you've ever said, if you've ever said in your mind, like, I, I wish this church was bigger, or, you know, I wish the singing was louder in this church. If you've ever said this in your mind, I, I'm not mad at you. I wish there was more activities. But look, if you've ever said these types of things in your mind and you are not on the encouraging side, shame on you. Because all you need to do is just get on the encouraging side of the coin and God will add to the church. 
So I just want you to reflect this evening, which side are you on? I mean, I talked a lot about the church, but think about this. Your family, are you an encouragement to your family? This is really easy. It is so, it is so much easier to be an encouragement to your family than it is in a church. Because guess what? In, a, in your family, I'm talking to the men here. In your family, it, who's, who's discouraging your family? Who's discouraging your family, men? Look, if there's somebody outside your family that's discouraging, look, women get discouraged much easier than men. They're the weaker vessel. So if somebody outside your family is discouraging your wife and discouraging your children, you need to fix that. You need to take care of that. You need to handle that. But you know who the person that discourages their wife the most usually is? You. Because you go home and you complain about your job and you complain about the church and you complain about everything in your life and pretty soon like, she doesn't even know why she's discouraged. She's just discouraged. Because she's like, oh man, here's this, here's this strong person and he's just like, he's all bent out of shape. What chance do I have? So men are the, I believe husbands are the, look, and I made this mistake myself. I made this mistake myself where I just go and I just, I just vent to my wife about something. And pretty soon I realize like all I'm doing is discouraging her. That was a mistake. It's bad leadership. We need to be encouraging. We need to be encouraging to people. So there's no place for complaints. Who am I going to complain to? I don't know. God? He probably doesn't want to hear it either, though. <laughs> complaints? What's the point? Complaints should just stay with you, and then you should just put things into action that need to be taken. Complaints? Nobody, nobody wants to hear it. Nobody wants to hear it. And it'll damage people. So look, it's easy to encourage your family. You're upset about something, you're depressed about something, you're not really sure about what you're going to do about a particular situation in your family, it's fine. It's fine. The Lord's going to work it out. I'm going to do this and, you know, just calm people down. Take the reins. Show yourself to be a leader and encourage your wife and your children. They're the weaker people. They're, they're, they're who you're supposed to be taking care of. So look, if your wife is is discouraged, if your children are discouraged, check yourself. Make sure you're not being discouraging yourself. And then if it's not you, if you're nothing but encouraging and they're still discouraged, well, there's discouragement coming in somewhere. You got, you got, a, you got a hole in the boat somewhere. You need to find it. Right? But it's much easier to manage a family because it's easy to, most of the time, it's, it's us guys that are being the discouraging ones. You just need to be positive. And look, I mean, there's always things to be positive about. You know, I'm going to preach a sermon on, on America on Thursday on the 4th of July. And let me tell you something, there's always something to be positive about. Sometimes I think we get too negative. Sometimes I think we focus on the negative too much. And it, you, know what, you know what focusing on the negative will do? There's plenty of negative things to focus on. There's always negative things to focus on. You could watch the news and just get depressed every single day of your life. But that would be discouraging. Man. And that could knock us out. So well, let's get back to Peter. Let's get back to Peter. He discouraged some people. And guess what, folks? Encouraging, especially in a church. He, he, let me get this across, too. Encouraging, especially in a church, it doesn't take a leadership class. I don't have to create a spiritual leadership class and us meet once every two weeks or whatever for you to be an encouragement. It doesn't take a leadership class. You don't have to go out and read a dozen self-help books. It just takes continuing on. That's all it takes. It just can't, takes moving forward. When times get tough, you just keep going. That's how you encourage your family. That's how you encourage your church. Look, times won't be tough forever. And you always have to remember that. Life's got you down. Don't let the negativity change your course. It's that simple. I mean, health problems, marriage problems, job problems, money problems. I had a guy tell me one time, if you got money problems, those aren't really problems. If money can fix it, he said, it's not a problem. But there's real problems in life. But the point is, in bad times, look, getting out of church in bad times is going to make it all worse. It's going to just exponentially make everything worse. In bad times, you just stay the course, and that's all you need to do to encourage others. And once you encourage others, 
you will start to feel better. Once you start thinking about encouraging others and you get your head off of yourself, I mean, this is a major problem with depression right here. People that are depressed, they're just self-focused. They're focused on themselves. You just focus on if you're depressed and you're down and things aren't going well, just go to church and help out a brother and sister in Christ. And guess what? In church, to be an encouragement in church, you don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. Garrett's sermon on Sunday night was perfect. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the best things to say. As a matter of fact, most people should say less. Just sitting there and saying nothing and listening to somebody is encouraging. It's encouraging to have somebody to come to church and you had something bad and you just talk to somebody about a, a bad time that you had or something that happened in your week and just have that person just not say anything at all. They don't have to give you some sage advice on anything and they just listen to you. But they actually listen. They don't have a leaf blower. They listen to you. They care about what's going on. And guess what? By saying nothing and just standing there, and actually just caring, they're encouraging. That's how easy it is. That's how easy it is. Just be present. I remember during COVID, during COVID, this was the epitome of this for me. During COVID, coming to church was like, it just made everything okay. Because I felt like this country that I thought I knew was flipped on its head. I was like, everybody's gone insane. People are going along with all this. This is just crazy. But I came to church, and everything was okay. Because I was like, you know what? I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one that thinks this way. But folks, that's how easy it is to be an encouragement to people in this Christian life. It's easy to do. And it's a hugely important thing that we do. Just be present. Just be there. Just hear people. Show up. Very simple. Let's bow our heads and have a word.